Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, okay, I have a couple things at the top. Please bear with me. So on Saturday, a suspect shot and injured five individuals along Interstate 75 in Kentucky and is still at large. We are praying for those who were injured and wishing them a speedy recovery. The president was briefed over the weekend and he urges residents to remain vigilant and listen to local officials as they continue to investigate. The administration is in touch with state and local officials and federal law enforcement is supporting the local investigation and efforts to apprehend the suspects. Next, we are praying for the thousands of Americans under mandatory evacuations under uh, orders uh, out west. Senior administration officials are monitoring the fires, including the Line Fire in California and the Davis Fire in Nevada, and are in close touch with state and local leaders to ensure they have the resources they need. Over 7,000 federal personnel are supporting local firefighting efforts across multiple states. Residents in the affected areas should remain vigilant and heed the warnings of local officials, especially those who have been ordered to evacuate. President Biden and Vice President Harris believe that health care is a right, not a privilege, and the mental health care is health care, period. But for millions of Americans, care for mental health and substance use conditions is still hard to find and hard to afford. Today, the Biden-Harris administration is taking a step forward, changing that by placing new requirements on health plans that will improve and strengthen access to mental health care for 175 million Americans with private health insurance. For the president, it's simple. If you have a mental health crisis, you should be able to access the care that you need, the same way you access care for a broken bone or a heart attack. Addressing mental health crisis is a key priority for this president, for this administration, and the steps being taken today will dramatically expand access to mental health care in America. And finally, later this afternoon, the president uh, will, will be joined by elected officials and advocates to celebrate the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act and mark Disability Pride Month. One of the president's uh, first acts, acts as a U.S. Senator was co-sponsoring the Rehabilitation Act, uh, which banned discrimination on the basis of disability by any entity funded by the federal government and paved the way for the Americans with Disability Act. Since taking office, President Biden and Vice President Harris have carried the same commitment to ensuring disabled Americans are treated with dignity, respect, and inclusion are able to live and thrive in their communities. Under the president, uh, under this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, Americans with disabilities have seen historic increases in, uh, in employment and earnings, and the administration has taken significant steps to protect civil rights and promote full participation in society. And that work will continue. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Admiral John Kirby, who's here to take some questions on the House Foreign Affairs Committee's report released yesterday on the Afghanistan withdrawal. With that, Admiral. Thank you, Good afternoon, everybody. As you saw today, House Republicans released their investigation report into Afghanistan withdrawal. This comes, of course, two years after their first report, and this one says little or nothing new. We've already issued comment about the one-sided partisan nature of this report, so I'm not going to belabor that right now, but I do think a brief rundown of actual facts is important. First, on the very day this administration took office, the Taliban was in the strongest position it had been in years, and the Afghan government the weakest. The Trump administration cut a deal called the Doha Agreement that mandated a complete U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, and yes, that included Bagram Air Base, by the end of May 2021. That deal also released 5,000 Taliban fighters from prison. 5,000 fighters. In return, the Taliban agreed not to attack U.S. troops, which is a good thing because the former president reduced our presence in Afghanistan from about 14,000 down to 2,500. As General Frank McKenzie, former commander of U.S. Central Command, said himself in testimony, the Doha, the Doha deal had a, quote, really pernicious effect, unquote, 
on the Afghan government and military. As we saw, it demoralized them and it disenfranchised them. They knew right then and there that America was on its way out. Indeed, in October of 2020, then President Trump ordered his military to rush the exit from Afghanistan and have everybody leave by Christmas of that year. President Biden, for his part, faced a stark choice when he came to office. Abide by the flawed agreement and end America's longest war, or blow up the deal, extend the war, and see a much smaller contingent of American troops back in combat with the Taliban. He chose the former, and he was able to buy additional time to prepare for that withdrawal all the way into the summer. And we as a nation are safer for it. Any and every discussion about what happened in Afghanistan has to start right there. Sadly, the report does not dwell on it. Now, there's some other falsehoods, too many to mention, but a few do stand out, and I would like to tick them off if you don't mind. One, there was, in fact, planning for evacuations, planning that started in the spring of 2021 and included all the requisite agencies. In fact, the Department of Defense pre-positioned military units in the region so that once a decision had been reached to evacuate, they would be poised to respond in a timely fashion. Two, there was no fine-tuned assessment of how fast things would unfold in August of 2021. It all moved a lot faster than anyone anticipated. As the Taliban moved in, Afghan forces stopped fighting, and the Ghani government fled. As then-chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley said, quote, nothing that I saw indicated a collapse of this army and this government in 11 days, end quote. Two, or I'm sorry, three, there was no point in securing Bagram Air Base for use during the evacuation. Doing so would not only have required thousands of additional U.S. troops, but also would have required a dangerous trek by evacuees over Taliban-controlled territory, making the evacuation even more difficult to execute than it already was. Four, there was no handover of U.S. equipment to the Taliban. That equipment had been provided to Afghan security forces appropriately and with congressional approval over the course of two decades of war. That equipment was left by those Afghan forces when they surrendered or stopped fighting. And five, there was no deception, lying, or lack of transparency by this administration, either during or after the withdrawal. We did the best we could every day to keep the American people informed of what was happening. We conducted our own after-action reports and shared those too with the public. And as I mentioned, we cooperated extensively uh, in this investigation and, to continue, and we continue to work uh, with the War Commission. Ending wars is more difficult than starting them. President Biden knew that. He acknowledged that. But it doesn't mean that the decision to end this one was wrong or that the withdrawal wasn't conducted as professionally and as bravely as was humanly possible given the circumstances. It doesn't mean we don't grieve and mourn with the families of those whose lives were tragically taken during the withdrawal, especially at Abbey Gate on the 26th of August of that year. And it doesn't mean that we don't still look with awe and admiration at the many thousands of men and women who waged this war over the course of 20 years. Troops, diplomats, intelligence experts, contractors, and civilian employees from this and dozens of other nations. They accomplished the mission for which they were sent to Afghanistan. They helped make us a safer nation. Sadly, 2,461 of them did not make it home. And many of those who did still struggle with the wounds of war, seen and unseen. As the president has said, we owe them and their families a debt of gratitude that can never be fully repaid. But now that the war is over, our nation can better focus on other pressing national security interests around the world. We would do well in all this partisan rancor over the withdrawal to remember that. Let me take some questions. Thanks, Admiral. It's been reported that Iran has sent short-range ballistic missiles to Russia for use in Ukraine. Can you confirm that this transfer happened, and how concerning is this? I cannot confirm the reports that the transfer has happened, uh, but I would point you to what we have said in the past, that, that any such provision of that kind of technology uh, would not only have a, a deleterious effect on the Ukrainians' ability to continue to defend themselves and certainly on the lives and livelihoods of Ukrainians, uh, but could, depending on what the deal, how it's consummated, um, have, uh, ha have equally deleterious effects uh, on the Middle East um, and, and Iran that already has uh, a, an improving ballistic missile program 
we, we could only assume would, would want to stand to gain from some sort of partnership with Russia to improve their, their capabilities in the region. And of course, given all their destabilizing activities, that's a dangerous outcome. And is the White House prepared to increase pressure on Netanyahu to accept a ceasefire deal, potentially doing something similar as the United Kingdom in terms of withholding more weapons? I can't think of anything we haven't put more pressure on ourselves on than to try to get this deal. And we still, I think I just drew on myself. I think, um, I think uh, we, we know how urgent this is. And um, we're working night and day to try to see if we can get a, a deal in place. Hamas is the main obstacle to this right now. Okay. Uh, thanks, Thanks, Admiral. A couple of things. Firstly, on Afghanistan, so uh, are you, would you argue that the withdrawal is a success, or do you admit that there were failings involved in that? We have, I'd point you to the after action report, where I think we've been very clear uh, about uh, the planning efforts and the execution of the, of the plan. No plan of any operation whatsoever ever goes uh, exactly uh, according to the dictates by which you laid it out. Um, clearly, there were moments of great violence, and there were uh, uh, moments of, of, of mission execution that didn't go exactly the way we wanted it to go. I mean, I'm not, nobody's walked away from that. Um, but in the main, we were able to get 120,000 some, 120, some odd uh, folks out of there safely with an airplane taken off about once every hour. Um, and again, we've laid it all out in an after-action report that the State Department did, that the Department of Defense did, that we did here. And sorry, just very briefly, on, uh, on the, the point about um, Keir Starmer's visit and, uh, and Gaza, I mean, are, are, is the President going to be pressing Prime Minister Starmer to perhaps reverse his decision on the arms sales? Or, or conversely, might he be seeking some advice about, me, you know, about how you know, the U.S. might do that? Uh, and, and all arms We're looking sales. forward to the visit. There's an awful lot to discuss. I think you can expect uh, the Prime Minister and the President to talk about what's going on in Ukraine, what's talking about the Middle East, even in the Indo-Pacific. This isn't about twisting arms or trying to change minds. The British government has made their determination about uh, uh, arms provisions to, uh, to Israel. We respect that. That's for them to speak to. This is about how we move together uh, as principal allies and, and good friends on a range of foreign policy issues. And I think it's fair to say that um, that as part of this meeting on Friday, it, it will focus heavily uh, on an extended agenda of uh, uh, foreign policy issues, expanded agenda. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, Admiral, um, there have been requests or there have been signals from congressional Republicans they'd like to continue this investigation into what happened in Afghanistan. Has the White House received any more requests for people to testify? Would they entertain them? I'm not aware of any additional requests for more testimony. Has anyone from the White House or the broader administration been invited to tomorrow's gold medal ceremony for the families of the 13 service members? There will who died? be there will be quite a, a few from the Department of Defense, uh, both in terms of active duty admirals and generals and civilian political appointees and high leadership positions that will be there. And on the going back to sort of accountability and, and after action, was anyone ever held accountable by the president directly for what happened with the withdrawal in Afghanistan? And if not. Remind the audience why not. We have all held ourselves accountable for the, the progress of the withdrawal across the administration. And it was a true interagency effort uh, to get those 120,000 people out and to uh, make sure we removed our diplomats and our military personnel safely. Um, I, as I said, Ed, not everything went according to plan. Nothing ever does. Um, and we mourn the loss of of those 13 lives at Abbey Gate every single day here, um, their sacrifice doesn't doesn't uh, is not forgotten. Um, but again, uh, we we hold ourselves all accountable for that. One other part of the world, because there's been some movement regarding Venezuela just in the last day. The opposition candidate uh, Mundo Gonzalez is now in Spain seeking or expected to be granted political asylum. There's been a lot written and reported in the last few days about what the administration may or may not be trying to do to get Maduro to leave by the end of the year before his next term would begin, even though the U.S. and others don't necessarily think he has. What is the latest on what the U.S. is trying to do, and would they ever help Gonzalez come back to Venezuela? I don't get into hypotheticals one way or another about Mr. Gonzalez and uh, what his future might, might be. He wouldn't have had to seek political asylum if he wasn't 
accused of trumped up ridiculous charges um, and, uh, and forced in that manner to, to flee his own country. Uh, what needs to happen next is Mr. Maduro needs to heed the call of the international community and quite frankly the Venezuelan people and release the data so that the whole world can see what the Venezuelan people, uh, who they voted for uh, and that their democratic aspirations are met. Um, we have in the past, you've seen, it, uh, levied sanctions against Mr. Maduro and his regime. I don't have any announcements today, but I can tell you we're constantly looking at what our options could be going forward, depending on the decisions that Maduro makes. And does the White House anticipate any surge in illegal border crossings or attempts to do so because of the instability of Venezuela? Come Haven't seen that play out. I mean, obviously, we'll watch this as closely as we can. As you well know, the numbers uh, at the southern border have reduced and reduced significantly in, in the past uh, months, but have not seen any indications of a surge coming out of Venezuela. John, uh, China said that they'll be holding joint naval air drills with Russia starting this month. What's the level of concern from the administration that these two uh, countries are, are cooperating? Is this a sign of deepening cooperation? I think it is, sure. Um, we've been watching this defense relationship uh, grow and deepen uh, over the last couple of years to include the, uh, the exercise of their militaries in both air at sea and even on the ground. Uh, so we'll watch it like we all wa like we watch all exercises. Uh, but uh, I, I don't. Okay, these are two nations that uh, don't have a long history of working well together. Certainly not militarily. These are two nations that don't necessarily fully trust one another in the region or beyond or out, around the world. Um, so I see no reason for us to change our own military posture or d deterrent posture as a result of this exercise. This is a long planned exercise. It's a uh, uh, part of their, their, uh, their regimen. Uh, so we'll watch it and, 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 and monitor, but, uh, but there's no, uh, you know, there's no uh, dramatic imminent concern about it. All right, just a couple more, go ahead. Thank you, John. Firstly, on China, there are a raft of bills up for vote in Congress this week. Um, that have to do with keeping China from accessing uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding, that limit their EV market, that try to counter their influence on culture. Are these things that the administration supports? And do we expect to see these carried through in, in a Paris administration? Well, let's see where it goes. I don't, talk, I don't like to talk about draft legislation one way or the other. Okay. Well, let's talk about Afghanistan then. Um, Chairman McCall drew a direct line and countered something you just said, which is you said they helped make us a safer nation. He believes that the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Do you need a minute? Um, he argues that the withdrawal from Afghanistan has in fact made the United States more susceptible to terrorism because of those prisoners released from Bagram. What can you say to the American people to assure them that this administration is trying to keep them safe, and how safe are they? Boy, just go on CENTCOM's website. Look at the press releases that they send every time they take out a leader of ISIS or an al-Qaeda leader. Uh, we have proven the case about over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability to a fairly well. Now, that doesn't mean we're sitting back, resting fat, dumb, and happy. That's the kind of capability you have to keep working at and keep trying to improve, and we are. Um, I think it's also important to look at what else is going around the world. You know who, who would have loved for us to be stuck in Afghanistan for another 20 years is President Putin, President Xi. They would have loved that. But now, because we're not in a ground war in Afghanistan, a ground war for which the original mission had long since been accomplished, we're able to focus on those more, uh, uh, those more modern and relevant threats to our national security posed by, uh, by nation states and non-nation states around the world. But as for counterterrorism uh, capability, uh, again, we have proven time and time again that we are able to monitor the threat and deal with the threat, sometimes in near real time if need be. Not taking it for granted, not saying we don't always have to keep sharpening it, but believe me, we're focused on it. Uh, administration officials have said that after the six hostages were killed earlier this month that Hamas changed the terms of the deal. Did Hamas explicitly tell mediators that there are new terms, that, that they want more prisoners released? And would you still characterize negotiations as on the verge of a ceasefire and hostage deal? To your first question, yes, Hamas did change uh, some of the terms of, uh, of the exchange. Um, and that has made it uh, more difficult for us to get there. I'm sorry, your second question was? Would you still characterize the deal as on the verge? We still believe that um, even for the, the, the new amendments that Hamas has made, that, uh, that it's still worth an effort to try to see if we can't 
get back into a, a, a ceasefire negotiation, but we're not there right now. Uh, sir, there's a report that the president's convening his national security team on this issue today. Obviously, it's not on his public schedule. Is there anything more you can say about who he's bringing in or what he's doing, or is this part of the ongoing conversation? I think there was a little bit of a, 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 a miscommunication, Kelly. What, what was being referred to was his normal presidential daily briefing where he's presented with the intelligence of the day and has a chance to speak to some members of his national security team when he does that. It was not a major NSC meeting. Thanks, John. Um, the American citizen who was killed in the West Bank on Friday, uh, Aysen Arege, has the president had a chance to speak to her family at all? Um, and do you have any sense of uh, where the investigation stands? I know that you all had asked um, for the ball to get rolling on an investigation to her death. Do you know uh, if there are any updates on that? He has not spoken to the family uh, as of yet. I don't have a, a call to, to, uh, to talk about uh, today. Obviously, we continue to uh, mourn with uh, with her family, of course. Um, the Israelis have uh, reached out, made sure that we knew that they uh, were promptly investigating this. Um, as I understand it from just before I came out here, they are moving swiftly on this investigation and will soon, we think, uh, in coming days be able to present their, their findings and conclusions. We'll obviously we we'll hold our judgment until we see that. We've called for a complete, thorough, swift, and transparent investigation. We'll, we'll see We'll see what they learn. Okay, final question, go ahead. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, oh, do you have any response uh, to Russian drones violating uh, NATO member states of uh, Latvia and Romania over the weekend? I think you're talking about r reports that parts of drones, I think, have landed uh, in allied territory, if you will. This is... Uh, uh, Unfortunately, not a new development as it happened over the course of the war in Ukraine where missile fragments or drone fragments sometimes get caught up in the combat and the air combat and land in uh, a neighboring nation. We watch that closely, as you might imagine. We're in close touch with our allies and partners about that. Um, but uh, but it's just, it just underscores the, the danger that Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine has now caused to the whole European continent and the fact that the security landscape has changed, not is changing, not will change, but actually has changed, which is why we're doing everything we can to make sure Ukraine can defend itself. All right, thank you so much, Admiral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank okay, you. all right. Hi, Chris, it's been a while. It actually has been a while, right? It actually has been. All right. Um, question, uh, uh, first of all, on the war in Gaza. Yeah. The U.S. Secretary General said that you was willing to monitor any ceasefire deal. Is that something the White House is interested in, perhaps taking them up on that offer? Say that one more time. The U.N. Secretary General said the oh. U.N. would monitor any ceasefire deal. Is what I was interested in taking them up on that offer? Look, as you know, there is, uh, and the Admiral just spoke to this as well, we're continuing to have those conversations. Uh, we uh, continue to want to make sure, right, that we uh, get these hostages home. Uh, we want to make sure that we have an end to this war. That's what the president has said. Uh, and so we are pursuing certainly uh, all efforts, is something that the president said, to secure a deal that would release, uh, again, the hostages that are being held by Hamas. We cannot forget that the murder of the six hostages by Hamas and uh, has actually put us in a place where uh, uh, this is incredibly even the urgency is even more clear, right? And the new demands they've made uh, have called into questions, right? Hamas's readiness to do any deal at all and the sincerity of, of the negotiations. And that's what we see. So even so, even though we're hearing that, we want to continue to, to talk about the next steps with our co-mediators, this is Egypt and Qatar, and that's what we're doing, that's the focus, that's what the president believes in order, uh, the, path, the best path forward is to get this hostage deal, and that's what the president wants to see. Uh, the vice president is preparing for a debate uh, tomorrow night with Donald Trump. Uh, has the president spoken to the vice president about the upcoming debate? Yeah. Uh, and also, does he plan to watch it right now? So I can say, and I think I, I confirmed this last week in either a gaggle or at the briefing, uh, which is that the president uh, is going to watch the debate. He's looking forward to watching the debate. Uh, as uh, I'm not going to uh, preview or, or confirm any conversations between the president and the vice president. As you know, they speak often. Uh, the president is incredibly proud of the vice president. Uh, I just don't have anything to share beyond that. But he will be watching. We'll be watching in, in New York. Yeah, what, is he watch what is he watching for me? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into, into details, uh, but he'll be watching. He'll be obviously supporting the vice president uh, in her debate. I just don't have anything else to add to that. Thank you.
Thank you. Can you confirm reports that the president is hoping to establish a U.S. sovereign loan fund and give any estimated time of announcement for that? So I don't have, certainly don't have anything to, to announce from, from here. Uh, but um, uh, look, the president has worked uh, to unlock investments here at home. Uh, and abroad that benefit our economic, uh, our economy, right? The economy and also our national security. Uh, that is something that the president has worked to do uh, for in the past three and a half years. I just don't have anything to announce at this time. Thank you. Uh, with Congress back today, can you just give us the broad White House view on the state of government funding negotiations? And obviously you issued the veto threat on the House Republicans proposal, but with that dead on arrival in the Senate. So a couple of things. I think the SAP, the, I think the SAP went out, so certainly would, uh, uh, would, would uh, uh, direct you to that, uh, that came out of the, this administration. But with the end of the fiscal year rapidly approaching, obviously by the end of this, of this month in September, uh, Congress needs to pass a short uh, term continuing resolution to provide more time to pass full year funding bills. Uh, we urge Congress to do this quickly, to pass this quickly, to keep the government open. It is really easy. It's like their number one job. They know how to do this to keep the government open and provide that emergency funding for disaster needs. I just talked about that at the top, uh, about the needs that we're, we're having just right now out west, as they have done on a bipartisan basis. They've done this before many times in the past. They need to get this done. Uh, the proposal from House Republicans is not a solution. It's just not. Uh, it contains a partisan poison bill would erode our national defense, undermine our competition with China, fail our veterans and seniors, abandon communities struck by disasters, and hurt programs that support small businesses while making healthy tax cheats pay what they owe. So House Republicans should stop wasting time. I've said this many times before, repeat it uh, at this podium, and to do their jobs for the American people by keeping the government open. It is a simple job. It's their number one job as Congress is to keep the government open, and we believe it should be with a short-term CR. Okay, Selena. On that point about government funding, how is the White House engaging with the Hill on this, and does the President have any plans to meet with congressional leaders in the coming days? So um, I'll take your the first question. Uh, OMB, uh, Ledge Affairs Office, are in close touch with House and Senate uh, leadership uh, on the need to pass a short-term uh, CR uh, to keep the government open, uh, and I laid out what it would do if we didn't and what it would erode, example, for our national security, as we, we just had the National Security Council rep here. Uh, we're coordinating with Democratic leadership on the best path forward for a short-term CR. And so this is something that, uh, again, they need to do right away. They They've done it before, many times before, in a bipartisan way. It is their number one job. Uh, again, OMB and our Ledge Affairs Office. And to your second question, uh, the president speaks regularly uh, with congressional leaders and gets updated regularly as well uh, from his staff. And Congress knows how to do this. They do. They know how to do this. This is the most basic thing, most basic part of their job is to keep the government open. So they know this. Uh, they don't need to hear from the, from the president on this directly. They know this, they know this, and they can do it in a bipartisan way as they have in the past. And on the debate, when's the last time that President Biden spoke to Vice President Harris, and do they plan to speak again before she takes the stage tomorrow night? And just anything you can share about the advice or words of encouragement <laughs> or just what those conversations have been like? I'm not, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna detail any private conversation that the President and the Vice President uh, has, whether it's debate or not debate. Uh, that's not something that I'm gonna do uh, at all. But um, I, I don't, and I don't have a readout of the last conversation that they've had. What I can say is that he'll be watching. Uh, he supports, obviously, uh, the Vice President, is very proud of her, and I just don't have anything else to add. And will the President be watching with staff or his family tomorrow night? Uh, the President will definitely be watching. I know I will. I know you all will. Uh, I don't have anything beyond that. Yeah, Jack. Thank you, Corrine. Sure. Thirty-one percent. Good of job, one. Thank you. <laughs> it had wings, and now it's dead. Thirty-one um, <laughs> percent. Oh, of <laughs> I killed a bug. <laughs> You're welcome. It was very. Anyway. It was very dramatic. <laughs> I know, and the job was done. The job was indeed done. Thank you. you got the job done, for Thank sure. Thank you. 31% uh, <laughs> of registered voters said in a New York Times-Siena poll that they still need to learn more about Vice President Harris. 
So why is she spending so much time trying to define Trump and link him to Project 2025 rather than define herself? I mean, look, it, those questions, obviously, those are campaign uh, questions. You would have to ask the campaign, uh, and that is for them to, to speak to. Uh, and uh, what I will say is, um, what I can say is that uh, as far as contrast, the contrast can't be more clear. It couldn't be more clear. If you think about four years ago, America was reeling. It was reeling. In a once-in-a-generation pandemic, it was isolated from the world st stage. The crime was up. Uh, the middle class was sidelined. Uh, we saw an insurrection, an insurrection on January 6 in 2021 that the former president led. And so, and you think about today where we are today, Three and a half years later, we have, we're leading uh, the strongest economy in the world. Uh, you hear the comeback stories in places like Milwaukee, uh, to Dayton, to Scranton, Pennsylvania. And so we, are, we have done what people said we couldn't do, which is turn the economy around, turn the country around, be a leader on the world stage. And I think it's important for Americans to know and to be reminded where we were and where we are. Uh, and look, uh, and the president certainly agrees with her. He agrees with her, you know, her her leadership, her policy decisions. Uh, he agrees with her when it comes to making sure that, uh, you know, uh, we need to make sure that we stop what maganomics, what, what right? When you think about the $4,000 tax, tax, tax hike on working Americans. You mentioned Project 2025. That's something Republicans support. Is a radical, radical idea, a radical, radical policy agenda. That's going to that's going to do more harm to the American people. Trump has repeatedly disavowed it, distanced himself from it. I mean, you and I said Republicans. That's something that Republicans support. So this is not um, anymore being cast as something that Trump embraces. We just get that straight. I mean, look, you're, you, you asked me a couple things. You asked me about the contrast, why she continues to make the contrast. You have to talk to the campaign on, what, on her strategy and how they're moving forward. I laid out for you the contrast could not be more clear where we were when we walked into this administration, when the president walked into the administration, where we are today. And that's because of this leadership of this administration, the Biden-Harris administration. Project 25 is something that Republicans not going to speak to the president, the former president on this, but that Republicans are pushing. It's a radical idea. We're talking about more radical abortion bans, cuts to law enforcement, cuts to education, repealing Affordable Care Act, re and repealing the Inflation Reduction Act, which, by the way, beats Big Farmer, uh, which is something that, that many elected officials tried to do and couldn't get done. The Biden-Harris administration tried to get it done. That's what I can speak to, and that's just a reality. That's what's in that agenda. That's what Republicans are pushing, and that's what I can lay out for you. To the campaign, but their campaign's not holding regular briefings. They don't have a forum, a Q&A forum like we have well, here. I talk to them about that. I can't. For the I, 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 I literally just I just answered your question on why the contrast could be more. more clear. I just answered your question about Project 25 and what it's trying to do and what Republicans are supporting. I just laid that out. I don't think it was the question I asked, but I do appreciate the answer. No, you asked me. You asked me why the the vice president's campaign, the Harris campaign, is yeah. not doing X, Y, and Z. I said to you, you gotta you gotta talk to the the vice president's campaign, and that is there's the hat check. I got to be mindful to that. You know that. That is, I can't answer that question. How about but one different way? But I can talk to contrast. You asked me about contrast, and I just laid it out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Does President Biden define Vice President Harris as a progressive Democrat? Look, the Vice President has been a critical partner, a critical partner to this president. All you got to do is look at the record and what we have been able to do in the past three and a half years, the Biden-Harris administration has been able to do. You think about the economy, you think about health care, and you think about these really important uh, generation-changing uh, legislation that are not lo laws, obviously. I just talked about beating Big Pharma. That's important. That was the Inflation Reduction Act that only Democrats voted for. Now Republicans want to repeal. They want to take that away. Take that away, taking away lowering cost for the American people. And so, uh, to be clear, uh, lowering cost on, on medical care and, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs and also energy bills, right? That's two really big part of the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. The president, isn't, the president is not going to be labeling 
uh, the vice president. She has her policies uh, that she is obviously that he's in line with, uh, that they that she has put forth in the past week or so. Uh, he supports her. Uh, he believes in her leadership, and that's what I can share with you. We are allowing for a contrast with Trump, but not a contrast with other Democrats. Because Senator I, Bernie Sanders, for instance, yeah. said that he still views her as a progressive Democrat. He said that she's, in fact, uh, not abandoning her ideals, but making a pragmatic play toward the center to win the election. And that sends a chill down the spine of some people who might be in the middle or to the center right considering yeah. her. And when she's been trying to position herself as yeah. a more moderate figure now than she was in 2020, yeah. Where where does she stand exactly? So, first of all, the, the senator is going to speak for himself. That's for him to speak to. I'm not going to get into a I agree or disagree with him. What I can tell you is this president believes in her leadership and believes in her bold policy agenda. That is something that the president is in line with her on, right? And we're talking about strengthening the middle class. That's what we believe her, poli her bold policy agenda continues to do. And that's important. You hear the president talking about building a building economy from the bottom up, middle out, and strengthening the middle class. We're in line. More economic opportunity. The president wants to see that. And we're thinking. We're talking about the like, tax cuts for working people, fighting corporate pricing gouging, lowering costs, having the wealthy pay their fair share. We're in line. We're in line with uh, with what the vice president is putting forth. Her bold policy agenda to make sure that we do not leave people behind. I'm not going to stand here and label the vice president. The senator has every right to say whatever he wants to say. What I can say is the president agrees with her bold policy and agenda and and her leadership. Thank you. Wait, did I just did I just call on you? Okay. Yeah, let me just try and get other people. Go ahead, Karen. Go ahead, Karen. The Congressional Black Caucus yeah. released um, its corporate accountability report on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It asks corporate organizations to reaffirm their commitments to DEI, update on racial equity investments, and work with the CPC to create legislative solutions that will help close the racial wealth gap. Uh, does the administration have a reaction to this report? Have they engaged with the CPC or advised them about this report at all? So it just came out. We hadn't had a chance to review the report, but you know this is something that this, this administration believes how diversity is our strength. You hear the president say this, uh, and that is something that uh, the president believes. And that is true whether it's in schools, uh, our military, or businesses. It is important. Uh, and it is true for our government, uh, where he has assembled the most diverse presidential administration in history. That is something that this president uh, and this vice president has done. And just a couple of things in June, when senior White House officials, uh, they were able to welcome business executive and civil rights leaders to the White House for a, dis for a discussion on ensuring how Americans have access to economic opportunities. That wasn't that long ago, just a couple of months ago. And at that event, business leaders joined civil rights leaders and congressional staff to share best practices and actions that will protect and create pathways to opportunity. So this is an administration that understands that it is important uh, to not leave any communities behind. And I think what we've been able to show these three and a half years, how those communities who have felt behind, like they were left behind, are now included in the process. They're included in our policies. They're included in our legislation. They're included in how we move forward, even in executive actions, right? And this is the president that takes that very seriously. He also believes it's important to have those different voices at the table, hence having a very diverse, the most diverse administration. And so while we haven't, we haven't gone through the study, uh, what we can say, we believe diversity is indeed our strength. It is important uh, to continue to do that work, and that's what you're going to see from this administration. Uh, CBC is also, as you know, hosting their annual <coughs> legislative conference this week. <laughs> Uh, and the president is hosting a Black Excellence Brunch on Friday. Yeah. Was that intentionally planned for this week with CBC? Yeah. Um, and was this was what can you share about the president's remarks that he will be giving? Yeah, so um, not going to get ahead of his remarks. The president's looking very much forward to uh, holding that brunch here, the Black Excellence Brunch here uh, on the South Lawn on Friday, as you just said. Uh, but I, I could share a little bit just more broadly. You can expect the president uh, to speak about the enormous contribution that black Americans have made to this nation. Uh, you've heard the president say that before as well. And, and continuing uh, 
our efforts, as I just stated moments ago, about making sure that there are opportunities for all Americans, for all Americans, including black Americans. So uh, that is something that the president uh, certainly, I think, will touch on. Uh, and he, you'll, you will hear more from him on Friday. Is the president or vice president attending the Phoenix Awards and giving remarks this year? Uh, they we'll have more to share years? in a couple of days. We'll have more to share. Uh, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, on mental health parity, uh, enforcement's long been an issue, and you know many plans haven't complied with requirements over the years. Um, does the administration the plan plan to be more aggressive in terms of enforcement going forward on this? Well, anything that uh, might be the legalities of it, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. It's obviously an issue uh, that's very important to us. It's a great step forward uh, when, you, when we talk about the mental health parity, and it is. It's a parity, right? Healthcare, mental health it should be healthcare. Uh, and so we're going to certainly uh, continue to, to uh, make sure uh, that effort uh, uh, is a, a key part of this administration in the next four or five months. Uh, any legal stuff, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals or anything like that, but uh, this will continue to be a priority that I can uh, continue to, to be very clear on. Kat Kelly. -O. How would you describe uh, the way in which in briefings and in other White House communications since the July 21st, you reference the Vice President more. We hear now more Biden-Harris administration, when if we look back, it would have been much more focused on just the President. So as you do that, how do you describe the importance of, you know, in this official way, yeah. talking about her and, and linking her to the accomplishments? Look, I think it is important for Americans to know uh, that the Vice President has played a very big role in the success of this administration over the last three and a half years. Uh, and we have said this before, even before July 21st, how much of a partner she's been, a critical partner. It is not the first time that we've said it. Maybe we're saying it more, to your point. Uh, but we've been pretty consistent in saying uh, that their partnership is important and how, um, uh, how uh, she has had um, even a critical role. If you think about some of these uh, historic pieces of legislation, where she was the, you know, she was that vote, the vote that she made in the Senate, uh, uh, helped pass that uh, legislation and turn it into law, the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, for example. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think it is important to note. Uh, how much of a key partner that she's been. And that's something that the president wants us to do. He wants us to, to make clear to the American people that the Vice President Harris has been here from day one, obviously, uh, and has had a, a leadership role, uh, and uh, will continue to do that. And do you see that as a part of her introducing herself to the country, which is something her campaign has talked about, yeah. but again, in this official lane? Uh, no, I get the official lane. Look, I... I, I, I I don't want to get into murky, murky waters here by by getting into her her own strategy. That is certainly something for for her to speak to. Uh, but we want to make sure that people understand, the American people understand, uh, that this continues to be a partnership. This is a partnership, and we've said that before. We've said that throughout the last three and a half years, uh, and uh, and you know the president respects her leadership. Uh, he respects her bold policy ideas, as I was uh, speaking to Jackie about uh, back and forth moments ago, uh, and he supports that. And, uh, and I think it's important for the American people to be very understand that, to be very clear. And that's one thing that we want to be very clear about from here. Go ahead, in the back. The Office of Management and Budget has asked federal agencies to start thinking about the transition, um, that regardless of where we are in a couple months yeah. and who wins, there's going to be some kind of transition. How are you all thinking about that? How is the president thinking about that? Um, especially given, I know at the beginning of this administration, a frequent refrain from your office was, we didn't have a lot of help during the transition from agencies within the government, people within the government. Um, how are you all thinking about what you want that to look like? So let me just state this first so that folks who are watching understand, because I know you all understand this. Um, what is happening right now is common. It is not unusual. It is something that every administration at this point, who are clearly coming to the end of their administration, have to do. So it's a, a common process, nothing nothing unusual there. Um, I, I'm sure we will have more to share to your question, uh, but, you know, the President, uh, look, when it comes to the job that he has had for the, you know, last three and a half years, almost four years, he takes that very seriously. He takes everything that he does, uh, everything that comes out of this administration very seriously because it's about the American people. It's not about him. 
uh, and in order to have a um, a successful government, he has to have that leadership to make sure it's a successful government, right? It doesn't matter for him or whoever is next. Uh, so I'm certain we'll have more to share, uh, but again, it's not unusual. The president, president's always going to do what's right for the American people, and this is part of that. The last transition was, uh, you're talking about how it's not unusual for government to start thinking about this, yeah. but the last transition was anything but usual. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. Not disputed. Um, but that's not going to be the, what this president does. Has he given any specific guidance? Has your uh, colleagues begun thinking about how you want to make it different? Yeah. Mean, Four well, years ago was not normal for a lot of reasons. I, I, you are exactly right. I'm not disagreeing with you, and we do not want to go back there, right? We do not want that. We do not want to repeat what we saw. Uh, the last time around in the last administration. It's not, it should not be about someone's personal agenda. It should be about the American people. And I think if you've seen anything, especially these last pa past couple of months from this president, is that he cares. He puts the American people first, and that's how, in your question, that's what he's going to do. He's going to do what's right uh, for the American people, and how do we move forward in the way that we put them first? That's the best that I can answer that for you. Thank you. Uh, no, no problem. Karen, good to see you. I think what the White House makes of former President Trump's comments over the weekend saying, uh, when I win, those people who cheated in elections in 2020 and 2024 will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Have you seen those comments? Has the President seen those comments? And what do you Look, think I could say I have not spoken to the President about uh, those types of comments. Um, uh, and um, look, um, and I want to be careful because obviously he's saying it as in his um, campaign capacity. Uh, but those, that type of rhetoric is dangerous. This is not who we are as a country. This is a democracy. And, um, and so that's what the president believes. That type of rhetoric, rhetoric is coming from you know, a former president uh, is dangerous. I mean, we saw what happened on January 6 in 2021. 2,000 people went to the Capitol. You all, some of your colleagues reported on this. Some of your colleagues were there. Law enforcement members were attacked. It was a dark day in our country because our democracy was attacked. And they went there because they were told that they should overturn an election, a free and fair election, where dozens, dozens of Republican judges said that it was indeed a free and fair election. And so that type of rhetoric is dangerous and unacceptable, and that is not what this president believes. Just a quick question yeah, sure. on uh, uh, voters in particular. Uh, as the president makes some outreach to black lawmakers, I wonder if he's going to make some outreach to black voters specifically, you know, the campaigns, both campaigns are working to do that in states like Georgia. Yeah. And perhaps some of that economic message is getting lost with some black voters. If you talk to them, they have a different picture of the Trump economy than they do the Biden economy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, how is the president, the vice president, going to talk directly to black voters about the economic issues at hand? So i got to be careful because you're asking me about a strategic play, a campaign play, when you're saying voters, black voters in particular, in your question here. So I, you would have to ask the campaign specifically on how they're going to do that, what their outreach is going to, is going to be. But in terms of the record and... Uh, I, and, I, and I hear the question, so I just, want to, I just have to be really clear. We respect... Uh, Hatch Act, we respect the law here, so we're, I can't speak to a strategy here, but it is what you have seen this president, this administration do, cabinet secretaries, this president, uh, uh, obviously the vice president in her official cap capacity, is that we try to go out there, right? We go out there, we meet the American people where they are, we talk about what, this, what we have done in this administration over three and a half years, we talk about how we've been able to rebuild the economy, we talk about how we're leading uh, the economy in, in, in the world, right? The strongest economy in the world. And uh, it is not done by accident. It was not by accident, right? It is because the president and Democrats in Congress, when you think about the American Rescue Plan, which helped turn things around, put checks in pockets, right? We're able to do that. Put shots in arms, right? So we can deal with a once in a generation pandemic. It was not easy, but we were able to get this done. Now, 
Do we understand that some Americans are not feeling that? Yeah, we get that. We understand. That's why the president is going to continue to talk about ways to lower cost. You saw the president and the vice president recently, a couple weeks ago, or just last week, no, no, a couple weeks ago, talk about um, how um, uh, you know the drugs that are going to be lowered in cost uh, because they were able to beat big farmer, and so now Medicare is able to do those negotiations. That matters. That matters to Americans. So we're just going to have to continue to talk about it, let Americans know. Uh, I can't speak to the campaign strategy. That's something that they'll they'll speak to. But the president believes it's also his job to communicate directly with the American people and to let them know what we're doing, uh, and the economy, the health care, climate change, uh, even on the, on the world stage and how we're being in our leadership and how we're leading in that way. And so, you know, it's continues, we're going to continue to do that, be out there. Um, recently, the U.S. identified the first case of H5N1 in a person that had no known animal contact. And I wonder if that changes the posture of the White House's pandemic office or if there's any updates as to how the administration is tackling this outbreak. So look, we take all of this very, very seriously. Um, so what we're going to continue to do is continue to monitor. Uh, and help states where it's needed, right? Assist, in, assist where it's needed. Uh, I don't have an update for you, but obviously our number one priority uh, when it comes to the pandemic office uh, and also um, other, other White House offices and what we're trying to do here is we wanna make sure that American people feel safe uh, in communities out there. And so we're gonna monitor it. Uh, I don't have an update for you at, here at this time, uh, but we take this very, very seriously. I think we're going to start wrapping up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. I know. Thanks. Uh, Karina, I'm going to ask you about jobs. So the Biden-Harris administration, <laughs> yeah, the Biden administration has been touting manufacturing jobs yeah, for, yeah. The past, for the past year. Uh, but the last jobs report showed that manufacturing lost yeah. 24,000 jobs. And the trend over the past three months has been a uh, loss of 11,000 jobs per month on average in manufacturing. So why is it going the wrong direction? So look, we pay attention obviously to all these reports. Uh, what we what we also want to do, yes, we pay attention to reports, we pay attention to data, but we also want to make sure it's taken into context. Uh, and so we can't lose that as well. Uh, a couple of things, you know, manufacturing investment has uh, hit all-time highs for six consecutive quarters. That's important. Uh, factory construction has more than doubled to an all-time high. Uh, and it also, it takes time for factories to build uh, and uh, to be built and also manufacturing jobs to be created. And so what we, what we created, but we've created over 1.6 million jobs in manufacturing and construction. So you gotta put this all into context. And we've seen businesses invest more than $900 billion in manufacturing and clean energy. And at one analyst said, and I quote them, after years of inaction, America is now building factories at a rapid uh, rate. And that is because of what we've been doing, which is investing in America. And there's always more work to be done. And that's one something that you can see from this administration. So, so you need more time. Is there a time frame as to when those jobs will materialize? I, I don't have a time frame for you. But what I can say is we got to take them all into context, right? We do. Like data is important. We pay attention to reports. But we can't miss what we've seen the last six months. Right, consecutive six months as well. We can't discount the investment that this administration has been able to make into manufacturing. Right, we can't discount the 1.6 million jobs that have been created. That is important. The 900 billion dollars in investment, we can't discount any of that. Right, that has to be put into the context as we're looking at that this particular question that you're asking me about manufacturing jobs. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you so much.